This presentation builds on what we covered in part one. So please watch part one, The Consequences of Insulin Resistance, if you haven't done so already. As relevant as knowing some of the consequences of insulin resistance are to recognizing just how important it is to reverse it, what probably interests you more is what causes it in the first place. And no, it's not all about what you weigh, how much fat you have on you, nor does it always take years to become severely insulin resistant. To understand it, it's useful to to understand it, it's useful to recognize one thing. Our bodies are in a constant state of change, becoming either more of one thing or more of another. If we look at the body over a period of time, it can appear as if there's no overall change. But if we look at it moment by moment, then we see that over any short period, we're either going in one direction or another. Think of this as a tug of war, with different teams pulling in opposite directions. If we look at insulin sensitivity and resistance as a tug of war, then we want to know who, or rather what, is on each team. What is going to pull you toward resistance, and what can pull you toward sensitivity? In this presentation, we'll look at the red corner. One thing that contributes a lot to insulin resistance is fat. Not so much fat in the diet, which often gets the blame, but fat in our bodies. Specifically, fat around our organs, known as visceral fat, as well as excess fat within our organs, especially the liver, the pancreas, the muscles, and our hearts. Doctors call this fat inside the organs ectopic fat, meaning fat where it doesn't belong. Aside from fat, inflammation is another major driver of insulin resistance, which is why some people are first diagnosed with high blood glucose when they're in hospital due to serious illness or injury. Inflammation is also the link between poor oral health, for example inflamed gums, and increased risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Although inflammation of our skin, muscle and joints can be obvious in terms of the extra heat redness, swelling and pain many people suffer. Low levels of inflammation are harder to notice. Inflammation from autoimmune diseases such as thyroiditis and arthritis, for example, and inflammation driven by excess fat as described previously. Many of us also have unhealthy bowels that don't do a good job of keeping substances that cause inflammation out of our bodies. Smoking also increases inflammation, as does excess alcohol and consumption of trans fats. High carbohydrate diets, ironically exactly what many people with type 2 diabetes are advised to eat, can also increase inflammation. Basically, whatever the cause or causes, inflammation is going to increase insulin resistance. Another important factor is sleep. Poor sleep, meaning not enough in terms of quantity or quality, or simply very irregular sleep, are all associated with insulin resistance. In fact, one of the quickest ways of making healthy people insulin resistant without using any kind of drugs is to sleep deprive them. Now how busy we are and our habits around sleep obviously influence the quantity we're going to get. Some factors also affect the quality. One such factor is exposure to blue light, especially before trying to go to sleep. Now that's the kind of light given off by screens, be they computer screens, tablets or phone screens. The importance of a good sleep for maintaining insulin sensitivity also goes a long way toward explaining why shift workers, frequent travelers across the time zones, people with sleep apnea, and people with chronic sleep conditions are all at increased risk of getting type 2 diabetes. A less obvious problem many of us face, and don't even think twice about, is social jet lag. A nice term that describes that we often have one sleep-wake cycle during the week and another on weekends. 
That's just like traveling to another place with a time zone an hour or two different. And it has the same effect on our body clock to drive up insulin resistance. While actual sleep is crucial for good insulin sensitivity, as well as other aspects of physical and mental health, being awake and physically inactive is, with a few exceptions, a driver of insulin resistance. We call the time we spend physically inactive sedentary time. Unfortunately, that's how many of us spend our day. We commute to work, sit at a desk for hours on end, commute home, where we spend more time sitting in front of a screen. It doesn't really matter whether you use a car or sit on a bus, a train, an airplane, or whether you're in an office, driving a taxi, a van or a truck, or anything else that forces you to sit for a long time. Time sitting in front of the computer or reading, although perhaps different for the mind, are both physically sedentary activities. With sedentary time, there are two factors that matter. The total time we spend sedentary and the uninterrupted time. Frequent light activity breaks are helpful in halting the rise of insulin resistance, even if we spend much of the time sedentary. Stress is another major factor. People have often told me that they were diagnosed with diabetes during a particularly stressful period in their life. And although stress is really only now becoming a key topic of diabetes research. On a basic biological level, scientists have known for a long time that stress hormones like cortisol, adrenaline, and noradrenaline, or if you're from the US, epinephrine and norepinephrine, raise blood glucose, at least in part by increasing insulin resistance. This makes perfect sense when you consider that stress is a survival mechanism designed to prepare us to either fight or run away from danger. In that situation, we want glucose, our main fuel source during intense physical activity, to be easily accessible to our muscles. Our liver obliges by dumping its stored glucose into our blood, ready to be taken up by our muscles for the fight or flight response. Now, not all stress is bad. Gravity provides the stress that helps keep our bones strong. Just ask someone who's spent a few weeks in space or has been bedridden for a while. The stress of lifting heavy objects makes our muscles stronger. Successfully dealing with a stressful situation can build our self-efficacy, our self-esteem, and our self-confidence. My immunology lecturer, Professor Frank Griffin, put it like this. Pressure is running for the bus and catching it, whereas stress is running for the bus but still missing it. The former can make us better and stronger. The latter breaks us down. Stress works well when we're in physical danger for short periods, and then things calm down quickly. Our physiology never developed to effectively deal with chronic stresses from finances, work, or personal responsibilities and difficulties, chronic illness or social pressures. These stresses are perceived by our minds, not just when we actually experience them, but every time we remember them or predict them. When we're caught in this stressed state, not only are we more insulin resistant, we're also more likely to crave high carbohydrates and high fat food. And the food we do eat isn't as well digested, because to digest food properly, we need to be in the exact opposite state to fight or flight. To digest food properly, we need to be in the rest and digest state. Also, when our stress level is high, our immune system doesn't work as well, and we don't think as clearly, and we're less likely to be motivated to do the things that benefit us in the long run. Pollutants and contaminants certainly also play a role, and they don't get nearly enough press when it comes to insulin resistance and diabetes. Our bodies do deal with toxins all the time. They even produce their fair share of toxins, even when healthy. In addition, our bodies have to deal with various amounts of air pollution. This comes in the form of industrial smoke, car exhaust, indoor air pollutants, including chemicals given off by mold, gases from aerosols, allergy causing dust mites, and fumes given off by paints, glues, new carpets, and furniture, for example. The irony is that 
More often than not, indoor air pollution is worse than outdoor air pollution. Cosmetics also often contain things that aren't the best for us. And because they're applied to the skin, they're often readily absorbed into our bodies. Beyond breathing in pollutants or applying them to our skin and hair, we also get them in our food and in our water. I'm not talking about bacteria or viruses that cause food poisoning. I'm talking about herbicides, pesticides, hormones, additives, antibiotics, and the list goes on. Although it's true that in most countries these things are regulated to prevent immediate harm, the real problem is that we aren't clear on how they all interact inside us over several years. Up to a point we can deal with these pollutants and contaminants, but they can add up. When they do, one of the consequences is insulin resistance, and it's at least in part brought on by inflammation. Dehydration is another factor. One of the symptoms of poorly controlled type 2 diabetes is excessive thirst and excessive urination. All of that water helps the kidneys get some of the excess glucose out of the blood by dumping it into the urine. In days gone by, diabetes was even diagnosed on the basis of sweet smelling and tasting urine. Now of course we can measure glucose more accurately. But this loss of water is a real problem if it's not fully replaced. Water after all is the thing in which life takes place. Our cells contain water and are surrounded by water. When those cells get dehydrated, one consequence is that they become less responsive to insulin. In other words, insulin resistant. So being well hydrated is a crucial factor in reducing insulin resistance. Lastly, insulin sensitivity also varies throughout the menstrual cycle. The specifics are a personal matter. Not every woman will react the same way at the same time. And some will even vary month to month, probably due to the many factors that affect insulin sensitivity outside of their menstrual cycle. In general though, insulin sensitivity will be poorest in the days leading up to and the days involving menstruation. Of course, this all assumes you aren't on hormone-based contraception. If you are, then the influence of your menstrual cycle may not be as great. Only monitoring your blood glucose regularly will give you a personal insight into how things stand. So a lot of things can push or pull us toward insulin resistance and other health problems. So much, in fact, that it can seem quite overwhelming. Consider, though, that much of the time our bodies do an amazing job of dealing with all these things. Even if you had type 2 diabetes now, you haven't always had it. And that isn't because you lived in a perfect health-promoting bubble. It's because your body was able to deal with the challenges. We only get sick when the proverbial straw breaks the camel's back. Everyone has a different tolerance, and what we do, and even what we think, can grow that tolerance or shrink it. The good news is that there is a lot that can be done to improve insulin resistance, and there is no need to do everything at once, or ever do everything at all. The less burden your body is with things that run into the less burden that your body is with things that run it down, the more able it is to heal and recover. So in part three, we're going to look at how you can start reversing your insulin resistance and bring your health back on track.